Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Sauer, Scholar Services and E-Resources Librarian here at Forsyth Library, and in conjunction with the Office of Scholarship and Sponsored Projects, the Scholarship Environment Committee, um, and lots of other participants, we want to welcome you to our Tips and, Trip, Tips and Tricks workshop for today. We have Marcella Mores from the Department of Communications um, joining us to talk about presenting professional oral um, presentations <laughs> exactly. at conferences, research meetings, um, or even in front of your class as well. So uh, Marcella is an instructor in the Department of Communications again and the, the program coordinator, basic yep, program co yep. coordinator for yep. that, for that uh, program. So with no further ado, let Marcel take this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the uh, newest, latest, and greatest tips and tricks presentation. I could spend probably a week talking to you about effective pre presenting and doing some of those things, but what we have found over the years, that would be myself and other people in the Communication Studies Department, is by focusing on a few things, it actually helps make the whole idea of giving an oral presentation a little bit more manageable. So I have lovingly titled uh, my presentation, a way for us to give a presentation, how to really kind of believe that idea of anxiety, because it does live in all of us. Uh, to, you know, not just kind of the sense of, oh, everything is roses or butterflies, but to turn that anxiety into, oh, I just, I'm feeling, you know, maybe excitement instead of that. So it is truly kind of, you know, how um, you look at things. Today, after this session, um, what I would love for all of you um, to get out of it is uh, three major goals. The first thing is I want you to be able to identify uh, some preparation strategies that I'm going to present to you, and these are just some basic strategies. The second thing that I, I definitely want you all to th consider and to think about is how you're going to utilize your nonverbal communication. And then the very last thing that I always want from everyone who gives a presentation is I want you to start changing your mindset in terms of how you're going to help yourself with confidence because that is key with any type of presentation that you're going to be getting, really. That is the key. So the first thing, um, step one, as I like to call it, is uh, preparation. I'm, again, honestly, preparation is key for um, everything, no matter if you're studying for an exam or if you're getting ready to give a presentation. How well you prepare ahead of time is what will push you towards you know, that distinguished level to the exceptional level that you're trying to really accomplish. So the first thing um, you know, that I uh, want to talk about is that, and to acknowledge, is that every person gets nervous. You are not on an island by yourself. Everyone gets nervous. Now, the levels of nerves are different. For instance, because I have given some type of presentation like this for about 18 years, I don't, I'm not as nervous now as I was, let's say, when I first started. But everyone gets nervous. So to think that no one gets nervous, don't believe it. Everyone gets some type of that nervous, nervous behavior. The second thing is that, and, and again, we put so much pressure on ourselves, but perfection is not the goal. We, we need to say the perfect thing, we need to have all of the words exactly the way that we need to say them. No, put that out of your mind. There will not be a speaker that you watch that is perfect. I am not gonna be perfect today, and I teach this kind of stuff. It's because it's unnatural to, in, in fact, people would almost think that maybe you're a robot if everything was perfect and how you were speaking. So um, again, perfection is not the goal. The third thing is that, again, that confidence. You have to be very confident in order, um, confidence in yourself, confidence in your mental, uh, what you've done, and just confidence in the material that you're presenting. I know a lot of you are going to conferences. This is your research. No one else did the work on this. This is your thing. So you are the expert in that moment. So own it, that's the confidence, and that's where it really starts. Okay, so we need to prepare. Uh, 
a presentation that we're getting ready you know, for a conference that we're going to. And I've done this a couple of times at various conferences for my discipline in communication. Um, and even for students, we talk about this as well. But the first thing that you need to do is we need to figure out what type of presentation are we actually going to be giving. So um, if you are presenting at SACAD, um, the Scholarly and Creatives Activities Day, you have to give a, a certain type of presentation or at least talk through your research um, or your project that you've completed. Find out if there is a structure in place because for a lot of conferences that I have been to, they do. They give you a certain time limit that you need to present on. Sometimes it's about 10 minutes, especially if there's a panelist of you know five to six people. They give you a very specific time that's very important to know because then you have to start planning around that time. It's not fair for you to go 20 minutes when someone, and then no, someone else doesn't get that time. And in fact, sometimes the moderator will cut you off. That is embarrassing for that to happen. So you wanna make sure that you plan appropriately, figure out what type of presentation am I, am I getting based on the conference that I'm going to or what I'm presenting to. That's really, really important. The second thing to think about is you should really consider who your audience is. Now the audience is anyone who's going to be watching a video version of what you're doing. Your audience could also be the people who are in that room. If I was going to a specific convention or conference, and I know it's a technology conference, the people who are probably going to be in that room are going to be technology educators. So, having that knowledge, I know that if I use certain words, the jargon, if you will, of technology or of that language, people are going to understand what I'm talking about. But if I'm going to a conference that um, is communication, and I know that they're communication scholars, I have to step away a little bit or change my language in order to fit um, my technology paper into kind of that communication setting because they just don't know that language. And a lot of us, sometimes we don't want to change that language, but our, knowing who your audience is, that is so important um, to being you know, on the right path in terms of how you're going to set up your presentation. The other thing to think about too with your audience is how many people do you think are going to be watching your presentation? I know that in, in some poster sessions that we've done with students, that it could be you are presenting one-on-one -on -one to a major advisor or to a professor or maybe even to a colleague. So you have to consider that your audience could be a couple of different groups of people and how can you adapt what you're saying in order to get to, you know, the discussion that you need to get to and how you need to make your presentation fit that. So again, understanding your audience, the demographic of your audience, always, always interesting and always a good thing to do. The third thing that you do when you prepare is, and a lot of people fight me on this, and I'm not doing it today, but <laughs> is to use note cards. I also, although this is a type of presentation, it's also, to me, this is like lecture present presenting or seminar presenting. So um, using note cards, sometimes people think that they are bulky or that I don't know how to handle them or I don't really know what to do with them. What I say with note cards is that note cards are essentially an extension of your hand and because of that, you cannot have everything written down on your note cards or you get a lot of this. Today I want to tell you about da, 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 and you read off of those note cards. You don't want to do that. But, and I'm, truthfully, I'm using PowerPoint the way it shouldn't be used, but I am using my PowerPoint as note cards today because notice that I just have a couple of key things on there not the entirety of what I'm going to say. And that's really what should be on your note cards, especially when you're presenting. Uh, let's say you are doing a research project. You need to give the introduction to your research project. You need to talk about your review of literature. You need to talk about your research, your study, etc. I can name about five different note cards that you could potentially use. 
you have your discussion section, you have your review of literature section, and that's really all that you need. You also don't, you know, you don't want to have more than, you know, really five note cards, or then you are just reading off of whatever um, you're looking at. So, using note cards, very valuable, and I'll come back to note cards here when I talk about the nonverbal uh, communication side of things. Last thing in preparation, and this is really, again, really a key thing. Sometimes we know the information so well that we feel like we don't need to practice. But the truth is, everyone needs to practice. Even I had to practice <laughs> this particular presentation. It helps you with timing. It also helps you kind of get some of those mistakes out that you may have practicing that you don't have otherwise. So I wrote on there, practice, practice, and then practice one more time. The thing, the key with practicing is that you make sure that when you practice, you're pretending like it's the real thing. You can read through it once, that's okay, but that's not practicing. You actually have to get up and have somebody your, my dog is a really great listener. He is fantastic. He's a great audience member. Uh, and he just sits there and, you know, kind of looks at me. But anything that you can present to, that's always, that's a really good thing to have. Um, it, because it makes, it forces you to give that interaction, that real life interaction, that you wouldn't um, necessarily get just by reading over what your notes are and practice with your note cards. That's always a really key thing too. So that way you know how they work, that you're not stumbling through them, that you have labeled them one, two, three, four, five, just in case you happen to have them all fall on the floor. Eh, that happens a lot and I, I get that and that's happened to me. So um, you definitely wanna make sure that you're, you keep practicing um, to various audiences as you're going through. I will say, also, and I put a check mark at the end of these just to kind of drive home the point, but let's say that you forget your note cards. Uh-oh, what are you gonna do? Hopefully you'll have time to jot down a couple more of your notes, you'll be able to recreate them, but if not, you have practiced so much that you could do it without the note cards. Not to the point where you're memorizing, I wanna be very careful about saying this, Memorizing is equal to reading your presentation. Both of them are terrible things. You don't connect with your audience and your nonverbals are not there. Plus people know when you're memorizing to them, especially if you have kind of a blank look on your face and you're looking over their head to kind of remember all of those words, it doesn't, it doesn't go well in the kind of that nonverbal area. So, but to be so practiced is a good thing. Um, it helps you think of other things, it really helps the flow of your speech if you know what you're going to talk about and what point that you're trying to get out of that. So prepare until you cannot prepare anymore. That's always a good thing. Step two, prepare one. Now we have to go to step two. When you are presenting, you have to think about your nonverbal communications. Now, by definition, nonverbal communication is essentially everything, including some things that are coming out of your mouth, because we have to include vocal fillers and uhs, ahs, ums, all of those types of things, and the tonality of our voice. But nonverbals are everything that you see in front of you. And, you know, we live in a culture where social media, people are taking pictures all the time, where you can show up on social media, etc. So um, take a look in the mirror this is what you look like. You need to know that. A lot of the fear that I think always comes from public speaking is that we're afraid what other people will think of you or we're afraid what people people are judging, you know, what what are they saying about me, that little voice inside of our heads. But you have to really put all of that out of your head when you're giving a presentation because you're thinking, you're already, you have everything on this checklist so that is not that perception of what other people are saying. That's not something we're concerned with. First of all, think about what your appearance is. Um, appearance is always kind of a tricky thing. Usually if you're giving a presentation to your peers 
or if you're giving a presentation to a, a group of people on a committee, you want to dress in a way that mirrors your presentation. Unless it is formal dress and they've told you we need you to wear a tuxedo or we need you to wear a suit, you generally don't have to wear a suit. It's just, but if that is kind of the culture of that committee or that presentation, then certainly you should wear a suit. Today, I am more relaxed and a little casual, uh, one, because I had to do some teaching, but also because I knew that I would, I would give a presentation. So I am comfortable, but um, I also am managing what the expectation of whatever my audience was. And I had a guess, because I was looking at the old videos of maybe <laughs> what the audience would look like. So choosing something that you feel good in Please don't wear new shoes. Oh my word, that is the biggest mistake that I have seen so many people make, men and women, uh, with the shoes. Nope, nope, nope. They wear new shoes and then they hurt their feet. You, you all know the story behind all of that. Um, so avoid that at all costs. At least wear them for a week or two so that you know how they're going to be. Uh, the second thing is, is you should always check your clothing. Now, I don't, I don't wanna be uh, you know, harsh about this, but you should always make sure that your fly is zipped. This is something we always tell the audience to make sure that everything is buttoned as it should be because you're going to be walking around and you are in a front, you are in front of a lot of people. So those are just kind of the last minute checks that you do. Look in the mirror, make sure everything looks okay, and then give your presentation. If you feel good in what you're wearing, that's going to translate to the audience for sure. The second thing is, Facial expressions. What do you do with your face when you're giving a presentation? You think, should I stare at the person in the eyes if I'm giving a one-on-one -on -one presentation? Should I you know, look at everybody around the room? Sure, if you're giving a presentation to a group of people, no matter what, you should always have facial expressions. You should also have facial expressions, even one-on-one. -on -one. Primarily because your face is telling the person that you're speaking to how excited you are about what you're doing. If I would just stand here and look blankly while I'm talking about this, it wouldn't be the same message. I'd be a little bit of a hypocrite if I did that too. So I, you have to make sure that if you're excited about what you're talking about, and again, the amount of time you've put in on your research is such a big deal. You should be excited about what you're talking about. So utilize your facial expressions. Smile when it's appropriate. Don't smile when it's not appropriate. Raise your eyebrows a little bit. Furrow them when you're talking about something serious. If you're not sure what your facial expression is, Go stand in front of a mirror. I'm not joking. I do have to say this, although we're in the, yeah, again, we're in the world of selfies now. So uh, we have students doing that. All, they know exactly what they look like at all angles. But um, you can look, at, look in the mirror and just, my favorite thing, what I used to do is I would get my phone out and I'd call my mom and I'd say, hey mom. And I would talk to her while I'm looking at myself in the mirror. When you do that, you start looking at what your facial expressions are when you're talking about different things. And I always say call your mom or whomever that you can show the entire range of motion, right? So it's, <laughs> I'm so excited to hear from you. What are you talking about? No, that didn't happen. It is every range of emotion every time I talk to my mom. And I love my mother dearly. She is fantastic. But every range of emotion every time. But it really did help me understand what my facial expressions were. So when I was seriously talking about something, I was like, oh yeah, this is, all right. I like, th this is a good serious face. This is, means, you know, I'm being serious about something. And it really does help. So look, at, find a mirror, look at yourself in the mirror so you know what your facial expressions are. The next thing um, for nonverbal is to really think about, again, now that we have our face kind of figured out, what are you doing with what are you doing with these babies and then what are you doing with your hands this can be also another one of those kind of uncomfortable weird things you know what how do how do i hold my hands and where do they need to go and do i put them in my back pockets and where you know all of, do i stand here like this you want to make sure that when you're using 
your hands and also your arms that you're not kind of doing this big show tunes type of you know dance while you're presenting you can be very excited about what you're presenting and then you start doing this and it gets out of control in fact everybody is watching your actions and they are in no way listening to what you're saying so I always say you know put your if you tuck your elbows kind of at your sides and then put your hands out in front of you like this this is about all the space that you need for any type of arm and hand gestures now you all have noticed I talk with my hands a lot it, it comes I think it's, it's attached to me I also when I'm making points I'll say first second I do this whole counting thing it's very it's you know very showy if you will but the reason I like to you know kind of add those extra points of emphasis is because it also helps my audience know where I'm at and what I'm talking about um, one thing when you're talking about a poster and we'll, we'll get to that here in a second when we talk about visual aid is exactly what you're doing with your hands while you're showing something and so that's coming up I'll show you how to do that as well but just randomly you know when you're talking about something or going through something this is about all the space that you need for your heart for your arms and also then for your hands and if you have a clicker like I do, you can, and you, I will throw it back and forth between both, just as long as you're not, you know, throwing it on the ground, or you definitely have uh, control over it as well. The next one is our body movement, which kind of I was leading into with your hand and arm gestures. So uh, body movement also, you know, kind of the same thing. One thing we do see a lot of is people will, you know, sway. That'll put your audience to sleep. That is soothing to me to do this back and forth uh, you can all, some people will rock back and forth like this the again knowing if you do that or that's kind of your go-to that may also be something that you don't you know do right away another thing to think about is uh, if you're using kind of that those body movements that you're not doing a lot of this Oh gosh, what am I looking at? Let me pace back and forth. This also will put your audience to sleep or you'll put them in a trance, whichever it is, because this is, uh, you look at this, well, them walking back and forth, and they're like, what in the world? Uh, you know, what am I looking at? So um, with your movement, you will just want to move ever so slightly and only when it makes sense between points. If, again, you are giving a presentation for a poster or something else, you may not be able to do a whole lot of movement because you need to stay by your poster. In fact, sometimes there's a lot of, especially with some creative projects, they're kind of all in a line. If, you, if you're able to, you know, maybe do one presentation on one side and then maybe if you're able to kind of walk over to your other side, if you need to show the uh, second part of the poster on this side, that actually would be you know something good and it helps break up the monotony of what you're doing here on this side and then you can move over to the other side which brings me to using that visual aid and how you're going to do that it's easy for us to have comfort in staring at a visual aid uh, for instance me just standing here and saying okay so today what I want to talk to you about this and then while I'm talking I look at my visual aid the whole time. This is a typical mistake that uh, many students will make. Um, not I haven't seen many of my conference people, uh, presenters do this, mainly because they realize they're doing it and they force themselves out of that trap, which is also, that's a really good thing, like, uh-oh, I should be staring at my visual aid. Let me turn around again and make sure that I'm talking to my audience. So forcing yourself when you practice to have your visual aid there so and also you know looking at yourself while you're doing that again so you understand how you're using it and what you're you know pointing to this has a little red dot to it so i'm able to do this especially if i'm a little bit far away from the audience that is certainly something to think about but if it's something that is very close to you pointing with your hand is perfectly fine that is absolutely acceptable to do that um, as well 
last kind of check mark on yourself. Recording yourself, and this kind of goes hand in hand with practicing in the mirror. These things are so important. Mainly because once you see how you present, you are the best person to be able to change any of those little behaviors that you don't like. Like, uh oh, what? I do this all the time with my right hand. Stop doing that with your right hand. Um, that, that's usually one that comes up quite a bit. Or why am I staring, again, at my visual aid all the time? I need to make sure that I force myself to turn and look at the audience. But all of this comes through practice. The more that you go through this, the more you can change, improve, and then delete some of those old behaviors that you have or that you think you would need to do. Step three, confidence. One of my favorites. Uh, this, I find this very interesting. I, uh, just personal background about myself, I first was a television news anchor and broadcaster. So I, <laughs> I am very comfortable in front of a camera. So the confidence aspect of it, that was never really an issue. For me, I always tell everyone that I'm presenting to, I have enough confidence, I could give everybody enough confidence to really get through any presentation that you want to do. A lot of it, because I understood my facial expressions, I do attribute this to all of my nonverbals. I know what I look like and I know what my nonverbals are, so that helps me with the confidence factor. Uh, a lot of self-talk also is, and I, I don't want this to seem as, you know, oh, sure, that's never going to work. That's, that's the kind of self-talk that I'm, that I'm talking about. The more that you tell yourself that you are going to do a great job, that this, I'm, okay, let me, let me figure this out. Let me prepare this part. Oh, that's good. You know, the more you can do that for yourself, the more you're really just building that confidence within your, within you. And it, to me, and I, again, my parents probably also helped with this, they told us we could do anything that we wanted to do, but we had to figure out how we were going to do it. And so we really took on a lot in terms of, I can do this. How am I going to do it? What do I need to do? And so that self-talk through, yes, I can do it. How I, I'm going to do it. This is a guaranteed thing. Now let me figure out how I can make it the best thing that I need it to be. Another thing a lot of communication scholars talk about is positive visualization. This is really a technique that they've used since the beginning of time where if you, and, and you can think about it right before you go to bed and then hopefully you'll dream about it so it'll be in your subconscious, but you think about giving your presentation, you think about doing a great job and your advisor or your, a peer comes up and you're like, you did such a great job, that was such a, a great presentation. Thinking about that, visualizing that over and over and over again, the research tells us that that is true, that you it will be a great presentation because you just keep thinking about it and how great it's going to be over and over and over again. Another thing um, that I want to be really clear about is that you will have moments of doubt. And the moments of doubt comes from that little voice inside of our head, that little negative voice that says, you're so nervous, you can't do this, they're looking at your hair, da, 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 da. all those little negative things that happen or that are a part of our self. So you have to push those down because you have to remind yourself that you know this is a great presentation, you got accepted to give the presentation, which is a big deal, and that people are going to come and watch you because they want to know what, you're, what you have to say. They want, they're excited about what you've researched. So that's also another really good one is if you are really nervous and you want to uh, kind of think about the presentation but you're still not really confident in yourself, you have to fake it. And everybody's like, what, that would be, why would we fake it? What would happen if you, you know, just fake that type of confidence. Honestly, 
everyone's faking it. <laughs> everyone is faking that confidence. Um, it's not because they don't they don't believe in what they've done, but it is pretty daunting to stand up in front of anyone and talk about what you've done. So pretending like, I, I know what I'm doing, I, I can do this, and really giving, again, going through all of those, that's your fake, that's the fake of the confidence that you have, is that you know what you need to say and you know what you need to do and so you just do it. And eventually, no matter what the looks are in the audience or what anybody else is doing, you just keep going. A lot of times too, we see as with students that immediately on their faces, they, they, start, they start that negative voice starts while they're presenting and then they almost shut down in the middle of the presentation. And it's because they couldn't push that little voice out and they couldn't fake the confidence long enough. I said, just fake it all the way through and push that little voice out of your head. You're doing great. You're being so hard on yourself. You're doing great, but you think you're not doing great. And just keep going through it and then you'll be, um, and then you'll be fine. And then lastly, and if I haven't said this a million times already, <laughs> if, as long as you practice, you, your confidence comes from practice and good practice. Again, not reading through your materials, but actually doing what you're doing. Um, you know, giving the same presentation or anything for years, that helps you feel confident about what you're doing and what you are teaching uh, and what you're showing other people, for sure. I, hate to, I don't want to wrap it up right there. So, I would love to entertain any questions that you may have. I wondered if you had any advice for um, presenting at a round table. I, that's something I'm familiar to me, so I didn't know what to anticipate there. Sure, will everyone at the round table be presenting? Do you know? No. I think it's a situation of rotation. So we, they actually have something similar to this at the National Communication Association is that they, the great ideas for teaching, they've split it up now. There's so many great ideas that they've come up with that they put us all in round tables. And you always know who the presenter is, I think, because the rest of us are more at, yeah, everybody always scoots back kind of at the horseshoe. So the person presenting is, you know, on the island, you know, on that, you know, center of them by themselves. But I think the same thing, all of these same things apply, except for you're at a seated position. And as long as, uh, you know, for me, I think whenever I'm sitting at a round table, because they, most of them will be pushed back almost so that you can, and I'll even push my seat back a little bit if I'm back from the table so that I still have them at my, so I'm not doing this kind of, you know, well, because you want it, I know, I think what you're thinking about is making eye contact with everyone and also making sure that everyone is engaged. I always scoot back just a little bit because I know that I can see them at this versus being close to them and then kind of turning. So that's what I would do. I would consider position of your seat for sure. Is it, will you have handouts? You don't know. Uh, it's coming in the summer, so I've got lots of time to sure. find out all these sure. things. So these are just yeah. kind of questions I need to be thinking of and finding out. Be choosy with your handouts. And what I mean by that is don't hand them out anything right at the beginning <laughs> because they'll only look at that and they won't pay attention to what you're saying. And I, and I get, I know why people do it. I mean, I've done it before even with handouts because I need them to look at whatever I'm looking while I'm talking about it. But maybe just wait until you're halfway through and then, you know, this is a, oh, this is a good time. Let me hand out. Or if somebody is there with you, or somebody beside me, like, hey, could you, you know, take one of these and pass it down at a time when you know you're getting ready to wrap up or you're ready for questions, mm -hmm. then that would also, I, I like that idea too. Because if not, they will only read that handout. Mm -hmm. And that you're like, oh, they didn't look at me at all. I was giving my, they didn't think about what I was saying at all with my presentation. So, and then, or they'll miss something that you said and then you just have to repeat whatever, and I, I don't like that either. I think that, that was a waste of time to repeat everything that you said because no one was listening, everybody was reading right. what you were saying. Okay. So yeah, I would definitely think about that. 
What else around table? Go ahead. I feel like I've noticed a trend at conferences to kind of do lightning talks or mm. speed talks where people oftentimes will time their slides to automatically move forward and mm -hmm. they're so practiced that their talk Speak. is timed with their slides. Yeah. Is that good or bad? Nope. <laughs> you want to know why? Because technology will fail you. That is a terrible, terrible idea. And like today, um, it doesn't help you under. It doesn't help you with your time management. And I would say that would probably go back to preparation. What if somebody asks you a question? while you're, I mean, they, they generally won't, so they're like, oh no, we don't have time for, you know, nobody's gonna stop them, for, and then all of a sudden your slide keeps moving behind you. You can't control that once it's already going. So I, I don't like the time, I've seen it before, and I've seen disasters with that for sure, because they, they could, and then they couldn't stop the time. Oh my gosh, it was it was almost a comical thing, you know, for a while. But uh, yeah, it was because they just couldn't. And those are the ones, uh, to be quite honest, they were forgettable, because we knew that they weren't engaged with the audience, because they were just busy. I got to get through. I got to get through this information as fast as I possibly can. That's why I don't want you to do your handouts at your round table, because then they'll, you know, they're like oh gosh, but but nervous people will do that. That because I don't want anybody looking at me. <laughs> I don't want anybody paying attention to what I'm saying. I mean, it does. You know, they they'll do that too. So, mm -mm. You, that we want them to be engaged. I've kind of considered the lightning round trend mm -hmm. to be much more of a learning um, tool, right? And in fact, I've seen it used in order to loosen people up. So at one of the conferences I attend every other year or so, they. They actually have a social lightning round yeah. where you have no control of the slides, but you must talk about the slides. Oh. And you know, so it's yeah. it's improvisational, yeah. but it's yeah. also how fast can you think and on and on your feet right. as well. Yeah. But, but that question also le leads me to ask in the preparation phase, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I always struggle with how much content mm -hmm. for how much time um, I'm verbose yep. and it's hard to control and stay on track. Right. <laughs> so, and remember, and I think, and let's, I mean, let's say the positives of that lightning round first. It helps you with impromptu speaking, which is a, which is a really big thing. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a huge thing to be able to have that, but you only have impromptu speaking if you have prepared for extemporaneous, which is what we're doing, you know, what yeah. I want you to do and what we're kind of teaching, you know, the world to do, is you can't impromptu unless you have a plan mm. down, unless you have that prepared. So for, maybe I should have done uh, tips and tricks just over time management. We should have done, that's the one, that's the one we should have probably done too. Check for next. Uh, next time, uh, next time on, you know, uh, for celebrate is coming to you live from the library. I, uh, but with time management, you know, one of the things we would say is you, you should always have an introduction to what you're doing. You graciously gave me mine today, but that kind of just idea, that's only gonna take you about a minute, maybe. Then at the very end, questions wrap up depending on what you know how much time that they give you for for you all I really you know 10 minutes is what I what I you know played for but maybe 10 minutes at the end so that means in let's say a, a 30 minute presentation take out the minute take out the temp you only have 20 really 20 minutes to talk about what you need to talk about so let's say you have five sections you have four sections Four, you know, four minutes per per each of those, and I always I always say five because I always think how research papers are, you know, how we structure those, but um, but yes, those kind of you have to stay true to that four minutes. You also can't go off script. I mean, and and by script I mean what you've prepared. Yeah. Going off of that, you don't have time for that. You and you won't. And usually conferences they stop like they won't let you. You know, this is it. This is all the time we have for you. This is all that you. This is all that you're going to have, and so you know, practicing within that and time yourself when you practice, especially after you get through one segment and you're like, uh oh, that was ten minutes. <laughs> that that's not going to work. And then you have to go through. Okay, I need to cut out this. I cannot, you know, talk about this because then the more that you have it down, you understand what you can talk about. Plus, 
you have impromptu, look at all that impromptu material you have. That extra time that you cut out, if somebody <coughs> has questions or anything else, that'll be your extra, you know, some of your extra time. So you plan for the sections and you plan for the amount of time that you have. I don't, did that, Jennifer, did that answer? It, it that does, it does. It's that planning process, though, you know, because I think uh, typically always have way more to say right. than there's time for. Right. And I lose control mm -hmm. of that. You yes. Know. And, and you have to force yourself not <laughs> to lose control. Because, again, what, I, I could have stayed with you eight hours today and we could have talked through each one of these ideas, but that's not, I knew that wasn't, that wasn't the script. That wasn't the practice time that I gave myself for each one of them. So uh, you ha you can't do that. You, if you want to be successful, you cannot go, you cannot go off script. So. Okay. It's one of them. <laughs> it's edited. It is, you have to edit yourself. And, and that's the hardest part because, you know, and again, I always tell this, I, I, I get it. This is, this is your thing. You want to say everything about it, but you can't because that's not, that's not what you promised the audience. You promise them this. You can't say all of this. So, and they're not going to be disappointed. Whatever information that you give them is the information that you give them. It's not, oh, I, I wish, well, no, because that's, this is what I said I was going to talk about. So this is, you know, the only thing, this is the only thing I'm going to talk about. The round table, I would say, is also a little iffy too, because that almost opens up the invitation for people to start talking. Uh, so you also, oh yes, good point, and then get back to whatever you're saying, oh yeah, we'll talk about that in questions afterwards so that you can get back to getting through everything as well. So you're almost kind of the, wrang you're kind of the time wrangler and the managing everybody at the table as well. And then those, the side, and then side conversations, oh my lord, <laughs> that, that, that happens a lot too in the round table as well. Yes. Uh, do you recommend practicing in front of someone who doesn't know about the topic so that you're clear or like maybe they could help you weed out material that may you may be trying to stuff in and include elsewhere? Sure. Or? I actually, I like uh, all of it. I enjoy, you know, speaking in front of someone um, when I had to defend my comps, I spoke in front of someone who had no idea what I was talking about so that I would talk about it in a way that wasn't, uh, that was clear <laughs> and manageable, talking about my topics and stuff. But um, I also like the idea of talking about someone who knows something about it as well. Anybody that is willing to listen <laughs> to you practice, that is, that's always good anybody that you can get but I yes anybody that doesn't know or that does know all of that is good it is good question what yeah. do you think is the optimal time to begin planning that presentation <laughs> in advance I'm, I, that's a mean question um, <laughs> summer June July July, July? Oh, it depends on how much time you want to spend on it right now but April, April probably doesn't look so bad for a July for a July presentation. That way you can you know knock it out in let's say a couple of weekends, and that gives you what six to eight weeks before maybe you have to give the where you're thinking about it, and that you can all right I'm gonna now I can practice this and keep doing it so that I, you know it. One thing I will say the pitfall that I was talking about. Um, oh shoot, let me get to it here the moments of doubt mm -hmm. because while you're putting it together you're gonna have the oh I don't want to dang it I don't want to put that in there and we spend a lot of time doing that when you shouldn't once you decide keep go forward with it and with it with any of the decisions that you make the more wishy-washy you are the harder your presentation is going to be mm -hmm. and that is it's not going to be clear and you're going to have, and that your self doubt starts coming in. So once you decide what you're going to do, stick with it. Stick with it. And yes, I would. Yeah, I would. So I would start as the mo the most time that you can possibly have to do it, the better it is. But sometimes we just like to procrastinate as much as we possibly can, 
so like, uh-oh, <laughs> now we have to give the presentation, but you know, again, you have to realize that you'll be amped up in those last couple of days. But if you've had all this time to prepare, you know what you're going to do, easy, easy. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you all so much. I hope you learned a lot from tips and tricks. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> come to the tips and tricks. We have one last um, workshop in the series, which happens March 28th at 3.30 here in the South Study Area, Forsyth Library. That will be Dr. Cheryl Duffy from the English Department and Dr. Emily Bright from the Robbins College of Business and Entrepreneurship. I'm sorry, Emily. I don't remember the exact department. There's so many of them in that college. <laughs> but they will be um, giving you all kinds of really useful information about etiquette, presentation etiquette, and how to properly present yourself to your audience. So, hope you will all come to the workshop or tune in on our YouTube channels um, for that one. And again, thank you, Marcella. Thanks. Thank you.